So there is one symptom that every single toxic person I have met has in common, and we can find out what it is by asking a very simple question. And also when we ask that question, it gives us the answer to how will we know if it's possible for us to trust again, be it in a relationship or be it in friendship. So starting with the last point, if you've been in a toxic relationship, you're probably asking the question, is it worth risking again going through what I went through in the past? It's so horrible to go through the relationship and the breakup and make sense of it that many people completely shut down and they don't want to take the risk. And I understand that. And at the same time, it sort of is paying the price twice. It means we've already been hurt in the relationship. We've already lost years. Some people might say it means you let the narcissist win a second time. But there's a way around this. This fear, of course, is completely legitimate, but I think it's rather helpful to reframe this a bit. So there's a rather simple way to visualize this. And all we have to do is break it down into three different categories. Category A will be the people who won't hurt us. Category B, the people who won't hurt us on purpose. And category C are the people who will hurt us on purpose or the people who are okay hurting us on purpose. Most people won't fall into category A because it's very difficult to never hurt other people, even if it's not on purpose. So most people will simply be falling into category B. However, if we are in category B and we hurt other people and it's not on purpose, well, we aspire to be part of category A. We would prefer to not hurt other people, of course, if it can be avoided. Sometimes we hurt other people, it's a byproduct, but if we can avoid hurting other people, we prefer to do so but that leaves category C. And category C are the people who are perfectly okay hurting other people on purpose because they think the other people deserve it. And this is the symptom that I picked up. They will hurt other people. You'll point out, I think you hurt their feelings and they will have a smirk and go, they were asking for it. They deserved it. They got what was coming to them. This is revenge. I do not regret the pain that I commit. Even if someone is being nonsensical and acting like a lunatic and we just need to realign them with the truth and stop their lies, the main goal is not to hurt them. The goal is to correct lies. And if we can do it without hurting somebody's feelings, we prefer to do so. But with narcissists, the goal is to hurt other people out of revenge. And so often we have the question, why is it that I attract so many narcissists? Why am I a narcissist magnet? And how can I avoid this happening in the future? Well, we can answer this using statistics. About 10% of the population are considered cluster B. And probably another 10%, they've got some toxic traits, not quite diagnosis, cluster B, but they've got similar enough behaviors for them to be rather, rather awful people. The percentage of people who will never hurt anyone else is probably below 1%. But for the sake of argument, let's just say it's 1%. These would be the people who simply are diplomatic enough to be able to always tell the truth, to never have to lie, but do so in a way where they're able to mitigate any people having cognitive dissonance or getting upset or feelings being hurt. It's not easy. Even with all of the tools that you learn in psychology and all of the tools that you learn working with other people, it is far from easy to be able to avoid this. But just for the sake of argument, let's say it's 1%. In other words, there's a 79 to 89 percent probability that we land on someone who, by and large, doesn't want to hurt other people's feelings and doesn't want to upset us. And if they do, they will apologize. It's not the goal. It might happen because, of course, misunderstandings do happen because we're humans. But if it happens, they feel sorry about it and they would like things to be better instead of crossing their arms, smirking and going, you got what you deserved. Now, let's put this into context. Let's say that we do indeed have 10% of the population that is toxic. Let's say that on average, you meet 100 people per year. In other words, you meet 10 toxic people every single year. So over the course of 10 years, that means that you have been meeting 100 toxic people in total. Let's say that you have a 95% success rate keeping the toxic people out. That still lets five toxic people go through your boundaries. Now, five toxic people over the course of 10 years is only one every two years, and that's enough to reap absolute havoc. The real question here for us is, how fast is it easy for us to detect these people? 
because the faster we can detect them, the quicker we can eliminate them. The question is understanding what are the red flags that I should be looking out for and how many of these can I tolerate, but especially how can I have a conversation with these people quickly in order to avoid giving them too much the benefit of the doubt and waiting and hoping and not knowing and all of a sudden 10 years go by and we've been stuck and these people have been poisoning our lives. How can we do this? Well, one of the flags, of course, is asking, how does this person treat people they have hurt? Do they treat them with respect? And do they apologize? And do they try to make things right? Or do they believe that they are entitled to hurt other people if they feel the other people were asking for it or hurt them or something similar? I would suggest that if somebody is hurting other people on purpose, if somebody is berating people who are quote unquote below them, waiters, people doing service, if they're being unnecessarily mean to other people and they are enjoying that, well, then I'd suggest this is the kind of person who can be unnecessarily mean to other people. And you have to ask yourself, do you want this kind of person in your life? And if you do, well, enjoy it. How did it work out the last times? And if you don't want this kind of person, sometimes you might have to simply reconcile two different people. On the one hand, you have the mask of the person who seems amazing and looks like a bit like an angel. And on the other side, you have the mask of someone who looks a bit like a devil and who is acting absolutely horrible. Someone can't be both of these people. Remember this. You are either one or the other. And remember, one of the main questions is to understand what is the worst someone can do? How do they act when they are frustrated? If someone made a mistake, do they own up to it? Do they apologize? Do they try to make things better? Or do they at least feel bad? Or do they target you because you are the one making them feel bad about something that they feel entitled to do? It's a common trope amongst swindlers and con artists to say, the person was asking to be taken advantage of. So all I did is take advantage of the person. I remember a person was being horrible to me when we were teenagers. And years later, she said, well, you agreed for me to treat you this way. You were enjoying it. That's why I was entitled to treat you that way. And I never saw things that way. I never thought that it was even possible that she'd be acting in such a horrible way on purpose. I just assumed that it was what a normal relationship was like, struggles communicating. But she was sabotaging the relationship because she enjoyed the power and she enjoyed hurting me. And she felt that she was entitled to treat me that way. And I had been asking for it. So have you noticed this trait with the toxic people you have known? Do you have any examples of times when they were unnecessarily mean or unpleasant to others and they felt justified and they would not apologize? Let me know in the comments. This actually reminds me of the story of a woman who was caught cheating by her partner and the partner was, was very hurt, very disappointed and decided to break up with her. And she decided to convene with friends and talk about the situation and people were finding excuses for her as often as the case. And she made a comment that, that really stuck with me, which was simply, you know, if he'd wanted to know, he would have asked. It's not possible that he was stupid enough to not notice that something was happening. Of course, I was lying to him all the time. And he should have seen through that. The fact that he didn't see through it tells me that he wanted to believe that I was not cheating on him. And the person who told him that I'd been cheating on him is the person responsible for destroying our relationship. He didn't want to know. He was told. And anyway, I was entitled to do what I wanted because of whatever problems, but I didn't feel bad about what I did. The problem is the person who snitched on me. Remember, this lack of remorse is what people will eventually face when they are in a relationship with the kind of person that we call narcissist.